In this video, we will cover the independent samples t-test, when to use it, how to calculate it, what each part of the formula means, and of course, we will run through a worked example to show it in action step by step. Now, you'll remember in the last video, we looked at the one sample t-test as we were comparing a single sample, our basketball team, against the population it came from, namely all players in the NBA. Here, we're gonna tackle a slightly different task. We are again gonna be looking at the mean vertical leap of our team, but this time, we will be comparing it against the mean vertical leap of our rival team. Since we are no longer comparing against the population, we are instead comparing two independent samples from the population, we need a different test. And that is where the independent samples t-test comes in. Now, just like last time, as coach of the team, we are losing sleep thinking about this question. Is the mean vertical leap of our team lower than the mean vertical leap of our rival team? And again, just like last time, the independent samples t-test can be two-tailed, where we're simply looking at whether the means are different, or it can be one-tailed, where we are concerned with a particular direction. So is one mean higher than the other? Or like in this case, is one lower? So let's do this. And as we've discussed many times now, every time we implement a hypothesis test, before we run the test itself, before we look at any numbers, we must first spend specify our null hypothesis, our alternate hypothesis, and our acceptance criteria. And you can see on screen, the more or less template definitions for each of those that we have discussed in the past. In the case of our specific question around whether the mean vertical leap of our team is lower than the mean vertical leap of all players in the NBA, the null hypothesis is gonna be stating that there isn't a difference. So let's put this in as our team's mean vertical leap is equal to the mean of the rival team. Our alternate hypothesis is what we're testing for or what we're interested in. So that will be that our team's mean vertical leap is actually lower than that of the rival team. For our acceptance criteria, we could put in any value we wanted, depending on how much confidence we want in our findings. But for ease here, let's again just put in the commonly used value of 0.05. And remember this acceptance criteria value will act as the line in the sand around which we make our, for the lack of a better word, conclusion around which hypothesis we think is more likely. But now we have these three things in place, we can go and run our independent samples t-test. So let's do this. From the test we ran in the last video, we know that we have 30 players in our squad and that their mean vertical leap is 67 centimeters with a standard deviation of nine centimeters. Now, as coach, we do some sneaking around and we manage to find out the same information for our rivals. They have 28 players on their squad and the stats show a mean vertical leap for their team of 71 centimeters with a standard deviation of six centimeters. So just like last time, while on the surface, it appears that our team is lagging behind on this specific metric. As coach, we wanna understand if this is a robust conclusion to make or if the differences could potentially just be down to chance or to noise in the data. So let's do this. Let's put in place the independent samples t-test and see what we find. And to do this, we need this formula here. And this is actually the formula for a variation of the independent samples t-test known as Welch's t-test. And I actually think it's better to know and apply this one in the vast majority of cases. The, I guess, regular equation for this type of test makes the assumption that the variance, in other words, how spread out the numbers in a data set are, it assumes that the variance of both samples is equal. And in most cases in the real world, at least in most cases that I've experienced, this isn't something we can guarantee. Welch's t-test, on the other hand, it doesn't make this assumption. So it's a powerful one to know. Anyway, let's keep moving. And as we always do, let's turn all of this into words. So looking over the formula, we have the sample means for both teams denoted by x bar one and x bar two. So that top row of the formula is fine. We have everything that we need. Then down on the bottom under the square root, we have the number of observations for both samples. So n1 and n2. And then just above those, we have the standard deviation for each sample as well. And more specifically, we're squaring those standard deviation values. Now putting all of this together will give us t which is the T statistic. And this is gonna tell us where on the T distribution the difference in the two means lies. And more specifically, it helps us figure out how likely we are to see this difference in the means if our null hypothesis that the means are not different was true. 
And from there, based on our acceptance criteria, we can come to some form of conclusion around whether we think there actually is a difference or if the difference we're seeing is down to noise or down to random chance. In our example here, since we are interested in whether our team's mean vertical leap is lower than that of our rival team, we are running a one tailed test and thus we are concerned with this split here on the left hand side of the distribution. And this split point is known as the critical value where it splits the area under the distribution curve by our acceptance criteria. And since we are using a value of 0.05, this splits the area with 5% on one side and 95% on the other. From last time, you'll remember that if we get a t-statistic that is less than the critical value, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. We are going to reject reject the idea that there is no difference between the means of our team and our rival team in terms of vertical leap. And thus we would become more comfortable with that alternate hypothesis that there is indeed a significant or reliable difference. And the reason that we would do this is that we're saying if the null hypothesis was true, in other words, if there was truly no difference between our team's average vertical leap and the rival team's average vertical leap, we would expect to see a T statistic as extreme as the one we've got less than 5% of the time. And because of this, we'd start to say, well, if it's that unlikely to happen, or at least if it's less likely than our acceptance criteria, then maybe it's not actually the case. Now, conversely, if we ran our test using the formula and we obtained a t-statistic that was above the critical value, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. A t-statistic such as this would suggest to us that the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the means is actually quite plausible or quite likely to be true. In this case, we are essentially saying if the null hypothesis was true, we would expect to see a t-statistic such as this, or in other words, one that falls within this range of values at least 95% of the time. And because of that fact, we might say it seems quite likely that the null hypothesis is actually true. And because of that, we would see no reason to reject that notion, or more formally, we would fail to reject that null hypothesis and essentially conclude that any differences between the two means was just down to noise or down to random chance. So from this point, we essentially have three things to do. Number one, Based on our data and our acceptance criteria, we need to find out what this critical value is. Number two, we need to use our formula and calculate the T statistic and see where it falls on the distribution relative to the critical value. Because with these two bits of information, we can state our conclusion where we will either reject the null hypothesis and tend our beliefs toward the idea that our team's mean vertical leap is actually lower than that of our rivals or where we will fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there isn't enough evidence for this and that the difference between the means is most likely down to random chance. So let's do this. Let's start with step one and find our critical value. Now, last time for our one sample t-test, we used a one-tailed t-distribution lookup table. And to get our critical value, we needed both our acceptance criteria along the top there, and we needed a value for the degrees of freedom down the side. Now, for the one sample t-test, degrees of freedom was quite simple. It was just equal to our sample size minus one. For the independent samples t-test, or at least specifically for Welch's t-test that we are using here, degrees of freedom is instead calculated using this formula here. Now this looks intimidating, but trust me that it isn't. It only really requires two things. It requires the standard deviation values for both of our samples, which we already have in the data over to the left of screen. And you'll notice in the formula that we are squaring these values to give us the variance. Remember the standard deviation squared is known as the variance. The second thing the formula requires is the size n of both samples. So while it looks a bit scary at first glance, it really isn't when we break it down. And remember, you'd seldom ever do this by hand anyway. You will often just do all of this in Python or R or Excel or whatever tool you're using. But it is very valuable to understand it under the hood. And on that note, of course, feel free to pause the video and have a go at this yourself. But to keep us moving, I'm just going to let you know that all of this boils down to a degrees of freedom value of 112.88 or 113 if we round it. And with this, we can now head back to our one tailed t distribution lookup table and find our critical value. Now, just like we did last time, we need to go along the top to our acceptance criteria value. And here we are using 0.05. And then we need to go down to our degrees of freedom value of 113. Now, since our degrees of freedom value is relatively high for a t-test, 
the exact value of 113 isn't in this table that we're using. In this case, best practice is to use the closest value that is smaller than the one we've calculated. So in our case here, this would be a value of 100. And where those two numbers cross, we find our critical value for the test. And you can see here, this has a value of 1.660. And this is what we wanted to know. It is this point here on our distribution, the point that splits the area by our acceptance criteria of 0.05, giving 5% on one side and 95% on the other. Since we are interested in the left-hand side of the distribution, we take this as negative 1.660, and we can do this because a t-distribution, by definition, is symmetrical. So there you go, that is step one, calculating the critical value. Step two is to calculate our t-statistic. So let's do that now, and for this, we will need our formula. And let's just rewrite this a little bit, like so, just to make it all a bit easier to follow. So let's start inputting everything into the formula from our data on the left. So firstly, we have the mean for sample one, in other words, the mean vertical leap for the players in our team. Following that, we have the mean for sample two, so that same metric, but for our rival team. We also need to put in the standard deviation for our team, which is nine centimeters. And since the formula tells us to square this, we will put in 81. We do the same for the rival team, so six squared, which is 36. Underneath those, we just need to put in the sample sizes. Since we had 30 players in our squad, this is 30 for sample one there. And for our rival team with 28 players, Let's put in 28. Now let's start simplifying all of this down. So 67 minus 71 on the top there becomes negative four. And on the bottom, 81 over 30 is 2.7 and 36 over 28 is 1.286. The formula says we need to add those together. So let's do that 2.7 plus 1.286, which is 3.986. We need to take the square root of that. So the square root of 3.986, which gives 1.996. And now we're just one step away. Our T statistic will be the result of negative four divided by 1.996. And that gives us a value of negative 2.00. We did it. Well done, well done, well done. And if we head back to our distribution, we see that this T statistic value of negative 2.00 would fall here at a point outside our critical value and lands us in this 5% area. And to put this into words, and we mentioned this earlier, but it's good to go over it again, now we have our result. What falling into this area means is essentially that if the null hypothesis was true, in other words, if there was truly no difference between our team's mean vertical leap and our rival team's mean vertical leap, we would expect to see a t-statistic as extreme as this, less than 5% of the time. And because of this, because that is quite a rare event, we see this as some sort of evidence to suggest that the null hypothesis is unlikely to be true. And so formally, based on all of this, we will reject the null hypothesis. And we would say something along the lines of with an acceptance criteria or significance level of 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis, which essentially translates to we have some confidence in the notion that our team's mean vertical leap is indeed significantly lower than that of the rival team. So as coach, we're not very happy. We've now calculated that our team's vertical leap is significantly lower than both the entire NBA and that of our rival team. Since this is a critical performance metric, something needs to be done. So we send an urgent message to the squad announcing that there is gonna be a rigorous four week training program starting immediately that will work on building up the team's vertical leap. While the players sweat for four weeks, Maybe we take a holiday, but when we get back, we have a third question to ask, and that is, has the mean vertical leap of our team increased following the targeted training program? For this, we will be using another type of hypothesis test known as the paired t-test, and that is exactly what we'll look at in the next video. I will see you there.